okay? And I want to read you how absolutely nervous, even though he launched my writing career, even though we've been writing and doing, you know, shtick back and forth for a couple of years, now I was going to sit down with him. And this guy is like an icon to me. And by now, to most of the rest of the world, not just me. So this is... This is called Happy Birthday to Me. Three weeks after my birthday, I wound up in Denver and was invited via Sue, that's Dee's fan club president, to dinner with the Kellys. This was my first actual sit down and chat meeting with them. And I was so nervous that before we headed into their suite, I pleaded, sit right next to me all night long and if they ask me a question, you answer it. <laughs> when you find yourself in an overwhelming situation like this, you want to be at your best. You want to make a good impression. Above all, you don't want to come across looking like Garfield's little buddy, Odie. <laughs> On the other hand, you don't want to look like you're having an audience with the Pope. Something right smack in the middle seems about right, but I was nowhere near certain I could handle a middle-of-the-road approach, so I was nervous. No, I was petrified. <laughs> I followed Sue and a couple of other DKFC members, all of whom were cool, calm, and collected by all appearances, into the Kelly's Hotel Suite, where we were to meet, and I managed for a moment to present myself as normal. I hugged Mrs. Kelly and said, hello. Then I went over and shook hands with Dee. So far, so good. But witness how quickly I went downhill after that, inside my nerve wracked body. We stepped over to the couches and prepared to sit down. Dee asked us if he could take our coats. Now, if anyone else on the planet had asked me that question, an easy answer would have been yes or no, right? I mean, he wasn't asking my opinion on whether the U.S. should get out of the United Nations. He was just asking if I cared to give up his, my coat for a while. I gave it serious thought. I thought, what does he want me to say? Should I say yes? Will he be upset if I say no? Finally, it occurred to me that it, he didn't give a fig whether I said yes or no, just so long as I said something so he could sit down. So I said no. That seemed to satisfy him, but not for long. Next, he wanted to know if we would like drinks. I don't drink, so naturally I said yes. Well, I just told him no on something else. I didn't want him to think I was a bitch. So I said yes. Then he, then he wanted to know what I would have. Oh boy, he had me there. He was pitching these incredibly difficult questions at me, and I was unable to feel them. Oh, whatever, I finally decided, hoping that would end the interrogation. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly probably recognized the fact that I had slipped into the much dreaded idiocy mode, a common affliction of fans, and tried to help me out. She suggested that I try a DeForest Kelly. I looked at her and I thought, gee, that's a very generous offer. <laughs> but I realized I wasn't getting the proper picture. She explained to me that DeForest Kelly was a drink known to all of fandom, except me, obviously. Okay, fine, I'll have one of those. Well, after a couple of DeForest Kellys, <laughs> vodka and water with a twist of lemon, I felt calmer. <laughs> no one had raised any other controversial questions similar to, can I take your coat in quite a while? So I was just sitting back and listening and watching everybody talk and laugh and have a good time. Not much later, we went downstairs for dinner. Dee sat at the head of the table. To his right sat, sat Sue Keenan, his fan club president. To her right sat Jackie Edwards. To Dee's left, Carol and Mrs. Kelly, and then me. There was nobody on my left for 100 miles. I quickly lost my nervousness sitting next to Carolyn because she is a doll, so nice and so much fun. She could calm a jackhammer. I know because she calmed me and I'm the greater challenge. We lost ourselves in some conversation about having both been raised in the state of Washington. At one point I was explaining something to her in great detail and a folder crease on my left sleeve popped me with a great deal of force and I stopped in mid-sentence and turned around on my left, fully expecting to find a waiter or someone who had come along to ask me a question. There was nobody there. I panicked. I thought, well, okay, Chris, how are you going to handle this dilemma? Well, I had two thoughts. I had two choices. I could turn back to Carol and just continue the conversation as if nothing at all had happened, or I could explain what happened. Well, naturally, I opted for the truth, but I forgot to provide a complete explanation. Instead of what I just told you, I turned back to Mrs. Kelly and said, strange, I could have sworn somebody just tapped me on the shoulder. Carolyn accepted this bizarre information calmly. She looked at Jackie. Jackie looked at her. They both studied their salads for quite a while and said nothing. <laughs> I'm amazed the Kellys didn't signal someone to bring a butterfly net. <laughs> it took me over a month to remember all the stupid things I said and did at dinner that evening. I found it comforting at a later date to learn that other fans ex admitted experiencing similar difficulties the first two times, they, the first few times they were faced 
with actually trying to communicate with the objects of their affliction. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, uh, another one. My mom and dad hadn't met DeForest Kelly. I was over the moon about DeForest Kelly and his wife, and they thought I was in love with a movie star. Um, and I kept telling them, if the man mowed my lawn, I would love him. It isn't what he does, it's who he is. It's what his heart is. So this is uh, the first time my mom and dad meet DeForest Kelly. Mom and dad drove down from Washington State to spend Thanksgiving with me. This was when I was in Hollywood. I was very excited about that because Thanksgiving without family members can be a truly pathetic time. Mom and Dad had never met Dean Carroll, and because they hadn't, they were under the mistaken impression that I was over the edge about this mythical couple. In a word, Dad particularly thought I was nuts. That was kind of okay with me because because I thought he was pretty nuts too. I dropped a note to the Kellys inviting them to share Thanksgiving dinner with us that, that year. I knew they probably wouldn't or couldn't, but it couldn't hurt to ask. I'd be giving special thanks for them at the table anyway. So it was a big surprise and a relief and a scare when the Kellys called. Carolyn said that although they couldn't partake of the dinner since they had other plans with another couple, they would like to drive over for an hour or so early in the day to meet mom and dad. I hung up the phone and mom and dad looked like a little like deer caught in headlights. I got goosebumps. This was going to be really something, the moment of truth. Mom and Dad were going to be able to proclaim at the conclusion of this visit whether or not I was bonkers. <laughs> On Thanksgiving Day, Mom and Dad dressed up a little more, more than usual, and Dad jabbed me with a caustic comment, we better dress up for these gods who are visiting us today. <laughs> I could tell he was ready to prance me and say well in advance of the event. Needless to say, I was a basket of nerves when the doorbell rang. I went to the door and opened it. Dee had a lovely little plant in his arms for me. I said thanks and hugged him and Carolyn. I made the introductions and we all sat down. I sat as far away from everyone as I could get, hoping they'd settle into couches and chairs close to each other. Much to my relief, they did. I poured everyone coffee and they began to chat. Before long, Dad and Dee were chatting up a storm and Mom and Carolyn were conversing. Then it became a kind of a free-for-all. This occurred rather quickly, the moment the Kellys decided my folks were comfortable with them and not at all intimidated by the circumstances. They got into a sort of a gab fest about me initially because that was their common frame of reference. Instead of Dad's usual caustic remarks, I heard him saying some of the sweetest things about me. <laughs> then I thought that he was probably just following the Kelly's lead since they were being so complimentary. Then I decided, no, I guess Dad really did think I was worth claiming as a kid. He just had an uncommonly weird way of showing it. Acutely embarrassed by their comments, I finally directed, okay, you guys, knock it off. Carolyn grinned. Just stick your toe in the rug and take it like a good little celebrity. <laughs> I laughed, so did Dee. Dad told Dee a bald-faced lie. I never did like Star Trek much. He's the one who got me into Star Trek. I never did like Star Trek much, but I enjoyed the hell out of your westerns. That was music to Dee's ears. He enjoyed nothing better than having people recall and recognize his non-Trek roles. Dad said, I tell you, now that I've met you and see for myself what kind of a guy you really are, I think you deserve an Oscar for those sons of bitches you played in westerns. <laughs> Sitting here, you don't look like you could act at all. <laughs> Dee threw his head back and laughed. That was Dad. He had a way of complimenting people that just never came out quite right. <laughs> when Dee laughed, Dad realized he had said something a little amiss and made a course correction. He amended, what I mean is you're such a gentleman, such a nice, sweet, quiet, reserved man. Your role in westerns, I just don't see how you managed to do something that convincingly. You don't look like the kind of guy who could find something that alien to his own nature. I mean, even your good guy McCoy is crabbier than you are. <laughs> Dee got the point and was touched by it. Well, thank you very much. That's a very great compliment. Dad zeroed in finally and sincerely with, you deserve an Oscar. I agreed. Yes, he does. Carolyn nodded. Yes, he does. Mom said, it's unanimous. <laughs> when the door shut and the Kellys were gone, I was pretty well convinced that the visit had been a whopping success. Dad turned to me, sighed, and then said, Chris, I apologize. I thought you were out of your mind. I really did. I was afraid for you. But now I see. You were absolutely right about those two. Mom said, they're precious. You're very lucky to have them in your life. It was then that I said, and I'm lucky to have you in my life and on my side after all these years. <laughs> Dad, shot back. Dad shot back. We've always been on your side. I hugged him and said, I know. After that, I couldn't even joke about the Kellys without mom or dad coming straight to their defense. Now who was over the edge, I mused. When mom came down with brain cancer, um, 
first thing she said was, I would like to have Dr. McCoy as my doctor. And I said, no, you don't. Said, Why not? I said, his most famous line is, he's dead, Jim. She goes, well, I just want to tell you, if he'd have gotten to them first, I mean, she just jumps into this defense of McCoy. If he'd gotten to them first, if there was a, a, a spark of life in them, he would have, and I went, Mom, it's okay, I'm joking. <laughs> you know? I mean, she was just like rabbit in defense of Dr. McCoy and anything DeForest Kelly ever did. Now this one, you might need, this, is, this will be the last one, and, and we'll ask, answer questions after this. This was after mom found out she had uh, brain cancer. She'd had some uh, chemotherapy, she'd had surgery, and I want you to see DeForest Kelly's heart, because right now you've seen him funny. On March 27th, Carolyn called to let us know that she and Dee would like to drive over to my place the following Saturday and visit with my folks and me, if that's all right, I said. It certainly is. Uh, and she giggled. I gave her careful directions that, as they had only been to my new condo once before. Then she said, be sure your new kitties are on their best behavior and that they're looking good. I said, I can guarantee they'll look good. They always do. But best behavior? They're eight months old, Carolyn. They don't have a best behavior unless they're asleep. She laughed and said, they'll be fine. The Kellys visited us with her for an hour and a half. Mom was wearing a turban on her head to hide the fact that her hair had grown back in mismatched colors and textures after chemo and radiation and all this stuff. The hair was still patchy in spots. Instead of the silvery mane she had once enjoyed and been complimented on endless times, she felt she looked like someone who would make babies cry in the supermarket. <laughs> Despite the fact that the turban was warm and itchy, she insisted on wearing it when company was around or when she went out in public. The wig she had bought had long since been discarded as too hot, too scratchy, and too artificial looking. I was happy to see how good both Dee and Carolyn looked. The regimen of walking six blocks daily had given them a health, a look of such a robust health that they both appeared radiant. Dee had gained weight, too. The Kellys and Mom and Dad discussed their various health, health challenges. Carolyn bragged on Dee for having quit smoking. She said, we're both real Puritans now. Mom mentioned having developed a sweet tooth following chemotherapy. I never had it before. Carolyn said, I've developed a sweet tooth for that bittersweet chocolate Dee always gets. Dee leaned over to me and chuckled, now you know where it goes. <laughs> Dee told Dad that he was finished with acting. Dad told Dee, you're a hell of an actor. I never knew how good until I met you. I thought you'd be a real SOB after all those questions you did. Then he added, nothing against Star Trek, but you could hardly get a word in with Shatner hanging all the time, hogging all the time. Dee threw his head back and laughed at that, then clarified for Dee. In the fourth and fifth years, we were supposed to get our due. Each of our characters was supposed to have episodes spotlighting them, but the fourth and fifth years never came to pass. They met the kitties. As luck would have it, both of the little rascals had worn themselves out prior to the Kelly's arrival, so Ashley, the shy one, actually slept on Carolyn's lap while she stroked his long, silky fur and cooed to him. He's the prettiest cat I've ever seen, she exclaimed. exclaimed. His photos are beautiful, but they don't do him justice. Dee and Carolyn mentioned how wonderful mom looked. She said, well, thank you. Then she said, I miss my hair. Mm -hmm. Carolyn said, don't worry, it'll be back, better than ever, maybe even curly. That's when mom began her personal contribution to the visit. I don't normally do this, except around family. It's pretty frightening to the uninitiated, but I feel comfortable with you. Let me show you how my hair is coming back in, then you'll know why I wear this turban. Slowly, painfully, slowly, I thought, she pulled the turban from the top of her head, revealing the multiple colors of her hair and the remaining bare patches. I knew how much courage that took. I held my breath, knowing it might be a difficult moment for the Kellys, as sensitive as they were. Dee stood up at that moment and adopted a, a McCoy-like stance and authority, but he was still genuinely and authentically Dee. It wasn't fal false at all. Then he walked over to where she was sitting and said, yes, let's get a good look at you. It's time for your physical. Mom stood up. He embraced her and held her for a long moment. Then he gently pushed her out to arm's length, gave her the once over, head to toe, and proclaimed, you are a beautiful woman, Dorothea, and you're going to be just fine. I never loved DeForest Kelly more than I did at that moment. Mom melted, hugged him again, and responded gratefully, I know I'm going to be fine. I wish all of you people would stop worrying about me. Then she joked, I'm going to outlive all of you. Mom left the turban off a lot more often after that visit. DeForest Kelly had told her she was beautiful and that she was going to be fine, and that was the only prognosis she was prepared to believe. She and Dad drove home to Washington with happier hearts.
through that without crying. Uh, are there any questions? How old was he? Uh, he was 79. Oh, good. <coughs> was he? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, was he up here when he died, or was he still? Alive? He was in uh, California.